Good morning. Good morning. Hello, everyone. This is Barry Page, and uh, we're gonna we're excited today to bring this Infinite Banking webinar to you live, along with my guest host Joe Cosio and uh, Jerry Wood. So we'll get started shortly. Please get comfortable and eliminate all distractions. We'll be back in a minute. Good morning. Get my video going here. Hello, everyone. I'm Barry Page, and along with Gerald Wood, uh, I'd like to welcome you to the Infinite Banking Concepts webinar. And uh, we've got a special treat for you today. We have our guest host, Joe Cosio, who is going to share a live case study of how he's using Infinite Banking in his life. And, um, you know, it really doesn't matter where you are in life. Uh, this is something that we all need to understand. And uh, that's banking. Uh, Nelson Nash told me a long time ago that banking is the most important business in the world. Um, so we're going to talk to you a lot about that today. And uh, we're just really excited. Uh, we've got a lot of information to share. Uh, I'm going to share a few things with you right off, and uh, then I'm going to introduce uh, uh, my co-host and uh, guest hosts uh, and let them share their stories. So um, just want to uh, share something with you, though. Um, we're not techies, and we haven't rehearsed this a whole lot. Uh, we're just going and, and let you see if this is something that might work for you. We really just want to challenge you to be your best. And um, we want you, if nothing else today, we want you to understand that you are the asset here. So we want you to learn how to invest in yourself. And that's what we're going to share with you. Uh, we're just going to lay out the strategy that we use in our lives and uh, show you how it works. So here's what you're going to learn today. You're going to learn how to end uh, the endless cycle of debt. Joe is going to share, you, share with you his story. Uh, you're also going to learn how to recover lost interest and fees that, that you're probably transferring away. And maybe you don't even know it uh, because many people tell me, they say, well, I'll pay cash for everything. I don't have any debt. Well, we'll cover that as well. Uh, you'll learn how to grow your wealth predictably uh, instead of having to depend on uh, markets and things that you really have no control over. Uh, and you're also going to learn how to create tax-free retirement income, even though we're not going to really get into that too much, but just understand that 
uh, that is kind of something that comes later. And uh, it is a part of this. You also learn how to leave a legacy uh, for your heirs and your family um, real simply without having to hire expensive attorneys and um, uh, accountants uh, to do that for you. So uh, but the, the main thing is we're just going to show you how to get started with IBC. IBC stands for Infinite Banking Concept. And um, so that's where we're going to go. So uh, I have Jerry Wood, my uh, co-host here. Uh, Jerry, did you uh, have anything to share before we get started? Well, briefly, my history with Nelson Nash goes back more years than I can remember. Uh, the first time I ever met Nelson Nash was a, really didn't meet him face to face. I talked with him over the phone. I'm fairly certain that I was the very first agent to have Nelson come down and do a seminar for a special we had invited. Since that time, uh, in preparing for the last webinar, Barry, I don't know if I told you this or not, I was looking for some information in Nelson's book. And right. I realized that I caught myself cheating and reading past what I was looking for. This is a this is called infinite banking for a reason. It is only limited by your imagination. And my personal experiences I've learned I've really learned more in the last two to three years than I did in the the fifteen or twenty years before that. Um, the only reason I can think of is that my mind keeps looking for different ways to use it, or I have insight now that I didn't have when I started out. So this is a journey, and the first step in any journey is the most crisp, uh, critical. So hope we uh, are able to give you some insights that we've gotten, and we'll see how it goes from here. Sure. Jerry and I have over 50 years combined experience uh, with this, uh, with financial planning as a whole. And, um, you know, we don't, here, here's the big difference in what we do is we don't want to manage your money. Uh, I had someone introduce me uh, yesterday and uh, actually a couple of days ago as well uh, that said, I handle investments. Well, again, what we want you to do is to invest in yourself. We don't want to babysit or manage your money. We want to teach you how to take control of your money. So that's what we're going to share with you today. And uh, if you'll just sit back, we'll give you plenty of chances to uh, ask questions towards the end. Uh, I've had to really kind of shorten. Um, we're, we're trying to cram uh, all this experience into a one hour webinar for you today. So uh, we really do appreciate you joining us and taking time out of your busy day. Uh, I do have my son uh, working as a uh, in the background. So if you have questions, if, if you come up with a question along the way, you can put that in the chat box and uh, Ethan is going to be helping us with that. And we'll answer, try to answer all your questions uh, at the end and, uh, and let you know how to get started. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, if you don't mind, maybe telling me where you are and, and where you're from in the chat box. And if you're ready to get started, let me know. Just give me a one in the chat box or uh, uh, let me know you're ready to get started. So Here's a million dollar question. If what you thought to be true about your money turned out not to be true, when would you want to know? Most people tell me right away or yesterday, uh, but I, I talk to people on a daily basis that, that really think they have all this figured out, that they know how money works. And it's just amazing uh, whenever I share this concept or strategy with people, they really do not have a clue about what's going on with their money. So uh, I had to learn this and relearn it. Uh, I've learned it and, and read uh, the book, uh, Becoming Your Own Banker, many times. So um, that's what we're going to share with you. So basically, you're, you're at a crossroads here. You may have heard, uh, heard about that, but this, this, uh, the, there's a song, many songs about it, but, but the straight is tyranny. This is the road that the banks, the financial institutions, and even the government are taking us down. So you've got a chance to exit that right now and learn the truth. And once you learn the truth, you can take the appropriate measures to protect yourself and your loved ones from this financial tyranny. So here's been the standard advice, save money, get out of debt, invest for the long term, and diversify. Have you ever heard that before? I'm sure you have. 
And if it works so well, why do you think so many people struggle when we live in the most free and prosperous country in the world? And yet, despite all the warnings, people still follow this advice. So here's some headlines from just recently. Uh, half of older Americans have nothing in retirement savings. Social Security strategy could help you compensate for lack of retirement savings. So, you, uh, so they're telling you to depend on Social Security if you don't have enough saved in retirement. And that was the old three-legged stool that I'm sure Jerry could share a lot with us about. But problem is, uh, you probably know Social Security is broke. Here's some CNBC. There's a retirement crisis in America. Most people will be unable to afford a solid life. And this may be why Americans are so bad at saving for retirement. Mark and what? So they're putting all the blame back on us. But it's not your fault. Okay. And so what we want to do is just share this infinite banking concept strategy with you. And what it is is an exercise, an imagination. You really have to think outside the box and listen to somebody else other than the gurus uh, in the media. Uh, it's all about reason. It's all about logic. And it's all about prophecy. As a matter of fact, Nelson's book is full of scripture. And uh, if you just look back to your Bible, you'll find most of this uh, in the Bible. So what is infinite banking? It's a way to erase bad debt and create generational wealth. It eliminates the need for credit reporting in traditional banks and financial institutions. Perhaps you've tried to apply for a loan or credit card and maybe you've been denied credit or maybe your FICO score uh, wasn't high enough to get the loan or the rate you wanted. Uh, and so that's what we're going to focus in on today is debt. Now, that's just one. Again, this concept is infinite. So that's just one way to look at it. Uh, but we really want to share that with you today and really hone in on that because that's really the biggest excuse, the number one obstacle that people give me as to why they are not saving enough for retirement. So it's a way to finance your purchases through your own bank without depending on traditional banks and financial institutions. So if you need a loan, if you want to make a purchase, a major purchase, then you can use your own bank once you learn how to do this. And we do it through a custom design participating whole life insurance policy. We do it by recapturing the interest in fees that we now pay to others. So think about that for a minute. If you could just recover the money that's being transferred away and put that money back to work, your dollars are gonna work harder for you. So that's really what this is all about, is having your dollars work harder, have them performing multiple tasks for you. And so why should you listen to us? Well, I shared with you earlier, Jerry and I have over 50 years experience as financial advisors. And what we've determined and learned over that time period is that traditional financial planning does not work. There's a better way to do it. And we practice infinite banking IBC in our lives and we love teaching this to others. This is really my passion is teaching people how this works. You might be fed up with the banks yourself. Uh, maybe you're just sick and tired of paying interest in fees. Maybe you feel trapped in this endless cycle of debt. And we want to show you what the banks already know and what they're trying, uh, what they, they do. They're very successful at keeping us from learning. And that's how banks work. So imagine, if you will, never having to depend on banks for money. That means no bank qualifying, no bank rules. And having access to capital not just to pay off debt or refinance purchases, but what about for opportunities? Have you ever thought about starting your own business? Maybe you wanted to buy a certain stock or investment, but you didn't quite have the money. Maybe you wanted to invest in real estate. Many, many successful investors use this concept, regardless of what they might invest in. Uh, and it's usually not the stock market. So what if you could give more to your church, to causes, to create your legacy for the future. That's what infinite banking can do for you. It can revolutionize your, your financial picture and help you live the life you desire on your terms without bank rules. 
So in the next hour, you're gonna learn more about banking and finance than 95% of the population. And contrary to what you may have learned in the past, it's not about the interest rates. So it's not any kind of get rich quick scheme. It's no pie in the sky. There's no sales gimmicks. There's no upsells. There's nothing to sell on this webinar today. And it's not for everyone, okay? But just understand that you have to be saving or you have to have the desire to save money. Because if you're not saving money or you don't want to save money, this is not just a way to transfer your debt, okay? Because you would own the debt. And that's what we want to do, though, is put you in control of it so you can use this concept to recover debt and use it to build wealth. And that's what we're going to share with you. It does take time. It's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen in a month, a year. It takes time. Okay, uh, it's really up to you how you uh, treat this and how you uh, grow your wealth on your own. It does take discipline. Uh, it does take commitment. So if you're somebody that just doesn't pay your bills uh, and thinks you, you can just charge up your credit card and, and, and go on your merry way, that is probably not for you. It's going to take a commitment to uh, refinance, restructure debt if you have debt. If you don't have debt, fantastic you can still utilize this concept to build more wealth and to take control of your money. So with that being said, uh, I just want to share a few numbers with you. I just got these numbers today. So these numbers are fresh. This is the total uh, personal debt in our country. And as you can see, it's a pretty big number, $19 trillion. About $15 trillion of that is mortgage debt. Student loan debt has now surpassed credit card debt, so it's $1.6 trillion. College students are graduating college, they can't get a job, and they're in debt up to their eyeballs. It wasn't too long ago when it passed credit card debt, which is over a trillion dollars alone. So what that means is that every citizen in our country, the USA, has $59,000 on average worth of debt. The average Credit cards per person is 3.1. So people that have credit cards have three of them or more. Outstanding revolving debt, as I just shared with you, is over $1 trillion. The APR, annual percentage rate on credit card accounts, is about 16 to 18%. Uh, it's really a little higher than that, but obviously some people have lower rates or, or don't have uh, uh, any debt. But, but even people that have perfect credit, I have an 800 credit score and I get <laughs> I get offers in the mail uh, just about every day, and it's, it's just amazing. They're, they're offering 18 to 24% interest. It's, it's like, why would anybody want that? Um, but again, it's not about the rate. And unfortunately, baby boomers in Generation X have the most debt. That's what's sad. Um, so this was from March 12th, but I got it uh, just today. If you just Google uh, debt in our country, you'll probably find it. This is what it looks like. These are uh, the amounts of debt owned by the percent of income or net worth uh, that people have, okay? So you probably fall somewhere in that picture. Uh, and unfortunately, people that have no net worth uh, have the most debt. But even people that, that have a net worth of over half a million dollars still have debt. So uh, it's not uh, excluded uh, just to, to wealthy or, or poor people. Everybody has it. This is the annual pattern of spending that most people have. It's right out of Nelson's book, Becoming Your Own Banker, and uh, it shows where we spend our money. Uh, obviously, we spend the most on living. That's uh, our, uh, our expenses, but we spend a lot of money on our housing uh, and automobiles, and uh, you see here that savings, and we're being generous when we say 10%. That book was... Uh, uh, written, you know, a long time ago, 20 years ago, but really Nelson came up with a lot of these figures over 30, 40 years ago, but these numbers have stayed constant. This is where the interest goes. The majority of it goes to home loans, to mortgages, and people say, well, hey, you know, I've got only got a 2% or 3% or 4% rate on my mortgage. Again, it's not about the rate, it's about the volume. 
even people uh, that have those rates, I, I have clients tell me every day, hey, I'm selling, I'm moving, I'm downsizing, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a bigger house. And so you have to understand there's a lot of fees that go along with that. So fees are included here. And uh, fees are things like closing costs, um, the cost of carrying that mortgage. And you probably know that the first five years are where you pay the most interest on a mortgage. Okay, so if you move in five years, guess what? All you did was, was pretty much pay uh, interest and, and fees. So the problem is all of these items, the mortgages, the living expenses, the cars, they're all financed through other banking institutions. So what that means is the interest portion, right here, the red lines, of every dollar you spend is perpetual. So you don't just lose the dollar. You lose what the dollar could have done for you in the future, okay? Had that dollar been compounding over time. And uh, it, it adds up for most Americans close to at least a million dollars over their lifetime that they're gonna transfer away. So the volume of interest is the real issue, it's not the rates. So I just, I took those numbers that I just shared with you and I put them in some calculator, my calculator here just to share with you. So, uh, and, and this is average debt, it's not just credit cards, I, I can't break it down with this calculator, but it's revolving debt. So that revolving debt is a little higher than that uh, and it does not include mortgages by the way. Uh, it's everything from car loans to credit cards you name it. And I just rounded it off to $40,000. I took what I just showed you as the average credit card interest rate, which is about 16%. And then I took an annual investment return of, of let's just say 5%. Being conservative, it really doesn't matter. But what I want to show you here is that um, the amount of interest that you would pay on $40,000 at 16% is about $6,000. Okay. And so that's the first year. So it doesn't matter if you were saving or anything the first year. But what I want you to look at is over 20 years. So if you just paid that interest over 20 years, 16% on 40,000 balance, it would be $138,776. Now, had you took, taken that money and invested it at 5%, it would be $229,000. But guess what the bank earned or the lender? $940,000. Now, if you look at it over a lifetime, just the time, you know, for, let's just say from age 30 to 70 or 40 to 60, whatever numbers you want to use, 40 years, you would have paid $277,000, a quarter million dollars just in interest. Now, had you been able to invest that money, it would have been $838,000 at 5%. So you see, you could have earned more than you would have paid. Now, a potential lender, the bank, the financial institution would have earned $24 million. That's why banks love lending money. Even if you have debt, you probably notice you get credit card offers, okay? They want you to transfer that debt. They know you're not gonna pay off that 0% in a year if you've got 20, $40,000 of debt, they're pretty certain you're not going to pay it all. And so if you look at the end of that 0%, that rate goes up to 20, 24%. So that's why banks love lending money. And you may have, you may have seen the commercials for your car loans. We'll get into that in a minute. But uh, here's three ways to make purchases, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on here. There's the debtor, okay? And again, I'm sharing this with you because this is the argument I hear all the time. Well, hey, you know, I don't have any debt. I'll pay cash. So the debtor, they understand. They don't really have any savings. I just showed you people that, that, that have no um, net worth don't have any savings either. They're paying the most interest. But there's plenty of debtors that are saving money. All right. And so if you're a saver, you might think, well, hey, I'm saving money. So I'm earning interest. But you pay cash. So you break the compound interest curve. The wealth creator, on the other hand, saves money. He compounds his interest and he collateralizes his purchases. All right, so here's the debtor. They borrow money, they pay it back. They get back to ground zero. They think, hey, I'm home free. But then they have to borrow money again. Something else comes up. They pay it back. They borrow money. So it's an endless cycle there. 
Here's the saver. They think they're ahead. They save money. They get up to here. They've got a lot of money saved. And boom, they have to drain the tank. So their money is no longer working. They're on a new curve now. Every time this starts a curve, they save money, they drain the tank to pay cash, right? They save money, they drain the tank to pay cash, right? This is the wealth creator. They have to save money as well, but now they're collateralizing their purchase. So they pay themselves back. They loan money again, they pay themselves back. And pretty soon, see what happens is this compound interest curve is never broken. It's uninterrupted compounding on the money. So when you look at it over time, this is what it looks like. So compounding and being consistent are the keys to growth. I just want to share this with you real quick, and this is comparing compounding to speculation. So compounding is when your money is growing. Most people understand that. Einstein called it, uh, he's been accredited anyway, as saying it's the eighth, eighth wonder of the world. Okay, so what I have over here is compounding over five years. So let's just say a person got 12%. That's what some of the radio entertainers tell you you can get on your money. But what they don't tell you, and they, they say average, but it's not really average. So let's say you earn 12%, but you lost 6% the next year. That, that could happen, obviously. You could lose 12%. But let's just say it was only 6 And then you gain 12%. And then you, you lost 6%. So then you were flat. Now let's compare that to somebody that just got 5,000, or 5%, I'm sorry, every year, okay? And so here's their balances. We started out with $50,000, and so that's how their money grew. And if you look here, the difference over time, the person that just had the 5% actually has more than the person that was getting 12% and had a few bad years. It's an $8,000 difference, and that's only five years. If you look at that over 10, 20, 30, 40 years, that amount can be huge. And what if you lose money when you're going into retirement? It could be even worse. So you can compare this to an airplane. Nelson makes this comparison in the book, and I'll put everything together here. But we have a headwind, and that headwind is debt. That headwind is the interest and fees that we're transferring away. So if an airplane is going 300 miles per hour and it has a 100 mile an hour headwind, the airspeed is only 200. On the contrary, if they didn't have a headwind, they had a tailwind of 100 miles per hour, then that's 400 miles per hour, okay, airspeed. So if you can eliminate the headwind, your money can grow twice as fast. So that's, in a nutshell, what infinite banking is. Now, I want to introduce my guest host and client, Joseph Cosia. Now, I want to just um, share with you, Joe, are you there? Yeah, so I'm here. You hear me? Okay, great. Perfect. I want to share with you uh, a couple things about Joe, because Joe has uh, been a very disciplined learner. He is uh, the kind of client that I love to have. Joe had problems, but Joe recognized the problems. And Joe did a little self-education. He read Nelson's book. He asked me a lot of questions. He met with me uh, on a few occasions, and we did a review. And most advisors, uh, frankly, probably would not have wanted Joe uh, as a client, because Joe uh, had some debt and he's going to share that with you. And I really appreciate Joe being open with this and sharing that because most people want to clam up and hide the fact that they have debt. Uh, I've had lots of debt many times and I've had to dig out of this hole myself. And fortunately I learned the infinite banking concept because if I hadn't, uh, I'd probably be bankrupt. Okay. So it's helped me climb out of this hole. And I shared this strategy with Joe and, um, I was, uh, Joe will share with you a little bit of back about his background, but Joe's an accountant. And, um, and so Joe came back to me with his own plan. I was like, wow, this guy gets it, uh, you know, and, and he really wants to make this happen. So I had to have another meeting with him and just say, hey, you know, this, this takes discipline, Joe. It's not magic. And uh, he said, I get it. And so he put together this plan 
And uh, I went, you know, I said, hey, that, that works. So I'll let him share that with you, uh, his plan. And I'm going to uh, stop talking and, uh, and just let Joe share with you uh, what he's gained from this and uh, what he's got out of uh, Infinite Banking. So uh, Joe, just uh, perfect. Uh, hope everybody can see his screen there. So I'm going to turn this over to Joseph Cosio. Joe, thanks for being here and uh, sure. I'll let you talk. Okay, great. Yeah, um, you know, thanks for the introduction there. You know, I'm very anxious to share the knowledge gained, um, you know, over the past year and a half of studying and, and learning about this uh, infinite banking concept. And, uh, you know, I truly want to touch people. Uh, I truly, even if I got to one person, I think it'll be worth it. Um, I think a lot of people struggle with this. A lot of households today are in debt. And they're in a uh, what I call a you know endless debt cycle. So I wanted to show you my plan, my give you a little bit of my background and story here. Uh, you know I'm currently a controller, international paper at a paper mill. So I oversee all the finance and accounting of a manufacturing facility. Um, you know we have uh, uh, about 450 employees at the paper mill um, in Bogalusa. Um, so I am a, basically I'm the financial steward. Uh, of, the, of that production facility and uh, responsible uh, to um, make, ensure the financial assets of the company are in, are in place. Um, you know, I went to the University of Tennessee. I got a, a BS in, in finance. So, you know, I do have a financial background. Um, and uh, you'll, you'll come to find out that, you know, what you learn in school is not always applicable to the real world. And, you know, I had to learn the hard way as well. You know, while at the University of Tennessee, you know, I had a, good lot, a lot of good experiences. Uh, I met Mr. Warren Buffett, um, actually went to Berkshire Hathaway uh, shareholder meeting. Um, he actually ended up buying a company that we introduced him to, uh, Clayton Homes. And now it's one of the biggest, uh, you know, man pre manufactured home companies uh, in the world and also has a real estate arm of Berkshire Hathaway, uh, which kind of spun out of that. So I had a lot of good experiences. You know, I was part of the TVA investment challenge. So I managed a portfolio of about a half a million dollars um, for the TVA. Um, so again, I had a lot of experience around investments and, uh, you know, making investment decisions. I went to Science Hill High School in Johnson City, Tennessee. That's East Tennessee, uh, you know, up in the hills, up in the mountains. Um, that's, that's where I really gained my accounting interest. Um, took multiple accounting courses at, in high school. Well, had a great mentor, uh, Mr. Ed McKinney, who uh, kind of guided me and uh, uh, took me under his wing and introduced me to uh, accounting and finance. Um, and a little bit different year, and I was born and raised in San Francisco, California, so I'm on the other side of the country, uh, totally different from uh, East Tennessee, <laughs> but it's a lot of good, got a lot of good experiences I've had, you know. Um, you know, I was raised by my mom and my grandparents. Uh, you know, so I had a, a pretty humble uh, background and raising. Um, you know, uh, I, I was a child model, so I'll put that out there. Uh, for Macy's, I was able to meet uh, uh, wide receiver Jerry Rice, who's from a little town in Mississippi. Um, so kind of weird how all my stuff comes back to the South, but uh, uh, it's an interesting background here. A lot of good experiences. Uh, so again, to continue my story, uh, I was introduced to the IBC in around uh, early last year. You know, it's my 35th birthday and I was um, starting to look at, you know, my financial situation. You know, did I, do I have enough money to retire on? You know, how, how am I going to uh, plan out for the future? You know, how am I going to support my family in retirement? Um, and, you know, looking at my current financial snapshot and, uh, you know, it wasn't looking pretty. You know, I was right. You know, I have a pretty big family, have four children and a wife. Um, so supporting them, uh, you know, school debt loans, uh, you know, mortgage, credit card debt, all of that is just piling up. And you know, I make I make a pretty good good living as a controller. So even with that, uh, you know, took on a lot of debt. Thankfully, uh, my brother introduced me to a financial publication that kind of indirectly talked about uh, infinite banking concepts. And that kind of led me to um, seeking out the Nelson Nash Institute. Um, and they're looking for Nelson Nash, Mr. Nelson Nash, who wrote Becoming Your Own Banker. 
uh, on YouTube and watched a, uh, a YouTube video of him giving a presentation. And that uh, YouTube video, you know, caught my attention and really sparked that interest to, to go and learn about this concept. Um, Again, so I went on the Nelson Ness Institute and I purchased the audiobook of Becoming Your Own Banker. Uh, you know, I have an hour commute to work, so I listened to a lot of audio, video, audio books. So, you know, slapped that in, listened to it in a, in a couple days probably. And, uh, was just amazed by, by the concept and how simple, for me anyways, it, it, it was. And, you know, kind of was a little bit uh, skeptical about it as well. You know, still dug into it, uh, looked up the Laura Murphy podcast. Laura Murphy is, is affiliated with the Nelson Nash Institute. Um, they have a lot of good podcasts. They talk about the case for IBC. Um, they talk about how to go about setting up a, a, a policy for yourself and how you can utilize uh, you know, participating in whole life policy. Um, so that kind of just led and kept growing and growing. And I uh, went to their practitioner website and looked up the closest practitioner who was, who was Barry Page. Uh, so we, you know, sparked up that, uh, that um, relationship there, had multiple uh, phone calls, meetings, um, you know, still kind of was skeptical again, you know. So I attended the IBC think tank in February. Um, that's where I met uh, Mr. Nelson Nash over here, you know, uh, before he passed away uh, uh, you know, this past March. But uh, thankfully I got to meet him and uh, I've learned a lot uh, from from him, and um, you know, it's, it's a blessing that I that I have um, you know come across that. And that's uh, you know at that think think tank, you know actually Barry was there as well. That's where the IBC plan came to light. Um, you know I was it was I guess in the middle of the night really, and I, and I woke up and I was like, wow, I can really u utilize this. I wrote it out on a piece of paper. Uh, kind of diagrammed what I wanted to do and actually show the paper to Barry at, at the think, think tank that, that, uh, the next day. That, and, and it was awesome. And Joe, I just want to interject here. Um, it costs money to go to that think tank. And uh, frankly, over the years, I think I've had, uh, and I, I think I've been to more think tanks than, than any other advisor. Um, but uh, so I've been to about 20 of them. And I believe I've had, uh, two clients actually go to the think tank. Now, a lot of them have been to my seminars that I held, but uh, it costs money. And uh, so the point is, Joe, uh, again, is really an ideal client. He invested in himself. He got the education and he continued to learn. That's why he went to the think tank was to learn more. Like he said, he's a little skeptical. And, uh, and I believe that's really where the light bulb kind of went off because uh, that presentation that you had sketched out, um, you know, whenever he came back with all the numbers, uh, it was pretty amazing. So uh, I applaud you for that, Joe. And uh, you, um, you know, you really took the bull by the horns. Yeah. Um, so continue on, you know, uh, my why. So, you know, why, why am I doing this? Why, why was I on this journey? Well, um, you know, essentially it's to leave legacy behind. So here's a picture of my family uh, on the beach, you know, again, four children, uh, wife, uh, beautiful family, you know, to build generational wealth. So again, looking back, um, you know, where, where am I going? What, what's the future looking like? You know, it wasn't looking too, too bright, actually. You know, I, didn't have a, I didn't have a solid plan. Um, uh, again, build security for the family, you know, and out of this, you know, freedom. You know, I think a lot of people are in bondage to banks, um, the government through taxes, uh, really wanted to get that, that sense of personal freedom uh, for me, and that's really important, um, you know, not only financially, but spiritually as well. So again, here, here's, uh, here's the stranglehold that, that I was uh, finding myself in, you know, month after month, uh, paying directly to, to banks and credit card companies, you know, building no wealth. So if you'll see uh, my outstanding loans, uh, auto loan, $51,000, uh, you know, I had a consolidation loan, 26000 student loans, 56000 a mortgage, um, so making monthly payments, debt, you know, every month, uh, that, that equals about $4,400 a month, which is giving away to banks. Uh, again, a, the interest in the given year is, that's about $21,000, so never gonna see that again. 
Um, so just a little segue, you know, the whole idea and where the uh, idea of utilizing the infinite banking concept is to recapture that interest I was giving away. You know, paying banks and finance companies, again, for the autos, the homes, uh, the student loans. And as we mentioned earlier, you know, 30, about 35 percent uh, of every dollar that you pay out is uh, in interest and fees. So continue on, you know, reading, learning from becoming your own banker, uh, learning about the banking process. You know, it is a process. Um, it's a pool of money. Uh, the insurance companies, um, it is a process. You can utilize the whole life uh, policy to uh, in your favor. You can have multiple uses of your cash, uh, basically. So uh, again, the uh, other concepts in the book on being an honest banker. So, you know, if you have the grocery store concept, you know, if you own a grocery store, you own your own small business, you want to steal from that, from that store. So again, you don't want to steal from yourself uh, when you set up this, this policy. So it does take some discipline and commitment to, uh, to uh, set one up. A big idea that came to me, you know, being uh, uh, in the paper industry was the co-generation. Uh, he, he uh, Nelson Nash uh, mentions it in his book um, about co-generation. So at a paper mill, we basically utilize all the parts of a tree. So the bark, um, the black liquor, everything that comes out of the cooking and manufacturing process of wood uh, into paper, we utilize. Um, so we use that to make steam and ultimately to make electricity. To help power the plant. So multiple uses of uh, that one resource, again, ties back in with multiple uses of, of utilizing your own cash. Um, so that was another uh, defining moment for me. Again, wealth building, continuous compounding, you know, Barry mentioned earlier, um, not interrupting that compounding is, is very critical to building wealth. And again, uh, utilizing insurance companies with uh, impeccable uh, you know, financial um, history, um, over 100 year companies paying dividends over 100 years, you know, that, there's a lot of security in that. Um, getting away from the stranglehold of the government. So uh, utilizing this policy in the future for retirement down the road, being tax free, you know, we don't know what's going to happen in the future um, in the government. Uh, probably doesn't, doesn't look too bright, but hopefully it, it could turn back or, you know, turn around. And then uh, cash flow management. So you hear a lot about, um, you know, the case for IBC talking about businesses use, utilizing this as well as a cash flow management tool. But uh, as a household, you, we actually uh, have a cash flow management strategy. You know, we pay bills, we pay uh, house, housing, uh, credit for groceries and things like that. So, you know, all households are, are a mini business and have a need for cash flow management. Uh, so here's the light bulb that went off uh, at that think tank. You know, I kind of diagrammed this on a, on a sheet of paper uh, in the middle of the, it was probably three o'clock in the morning. I woke up and had the idea. But uh, for me, you know, the infinite banking concept was, was basically your own bank. Um, utilizing my monthly cash available and putting it in a policy, uh, a max, max allowed into IBC policy. And then utilizing uh, the cash value to pay off basically debt pay off these uh, instead of going directly to the banks um, to have a, a first um, a first use of the money before giving it away and um, you know, that that kind of uh, again was a defining moment for me um, and then here's the IBC financial freedom fund so again if I didn't have this uh, IBC policy set up I would not have if you notice down here three point almost three point four million dollars in the future um, as a retirement vehicle. Um, so without having this, you know, I would not have that. It would, it would be not even there. Um, and then here's my debt repayment plan. So, you know, you do have to have a plan to pay back uh, policy loans. You know, it's not free money. It's not uh, get rich quick. It takes discipline. So I knew that I had to lay out a plan to pay it back. Uh, if you notice the bad, the interest loss paying to the banks over a 10 year period is $115,000. I would easily be given away to banks. Well, I'm recapturing it um, with this policy. Um, and then uh, again, uh, you know, the dividends. So the um, receiving dividends from the insurance company, you know, that's showing about $800,000 in dividends. 
which I would not have had if I had, hadn't had this policy set up and utilized. So it's a really great vehicle. Um, you know, we, again, it does take a lot of education, a lot of learning, you know, how, how to build a IBC fund built for high cash value, um, you know, it does take a lot of knowledge. You know, you can't do it on your own, you know, as an accountant, as a finance guy, you know, I thought I could do this on my own. Well, you can't, um, you know, it takes, it takes uh, someone knowing how it works and working with um, someone who's willing to teach you. So that's, that's why our partner up with uh, Barry um, to help create this, this uh, fund. Wow. That's awesome, Joe. Appreciate you sharing that with us. Yeah. Um, and, and uh, you know, Joe's very humble. He, um, he, you know, he, he put time into this and uh, it did, it's not just happening. And uh, like he said, we had to go back and forth many times uh, to get this right. Uh, but the good thing about it is now he's, he's really, uh, he can see the light. He can see the light at the end of the tunnel because he's, he's whittling down on that headwind. He's getting rid of the debt systematically. And in turn, he's saving money with the same dollar. So the dollars are performing multiple uses. And uh, he's really just consolidating debt, refinancing it through his own private uh, banking system. So uh, Joe, I really appreciate you sharing your knowledge and taking your time uh, and sharing your story because it, it takes a lot, I know, to uh, to put that out there. So I really do appreciate you coming on here. Yeah, um, no problem. You know, uh, again, like I said earlier, you know, if I could touch one person, uh, you know, it'd be worth it. You know, I want to help help others as well. Awesome. Barry, one of the things, could I interrupt real quick? Yeah, absolutely. I forget it if I don't. But one of the things that you told me about Joe is that he was trying to run his entire paycheck through a policy and he didn't quite get there, but he, he, he ran it through the policy so that he would start building early cash value and use that money to, um, to use his banking transactions to take over this debt. Um, the more that, and that's the ultimate goal. If you read Nelson's book is to run all of your money through life insurance. And there's one thing that people seem to forget. They don't notice, it's in the book at least twice. I think it might be three times where he says as plain as you can speak that I am not talking about a policy. I'm talking about a system of policies. If you were an investor and you bought a franchise business, say McDonald's, if that franchise location was successful, what would most business people want to do? They would own, open another franchise. So if one policy is successful, two policies will be twice as successful. And I can't help but think when he was going through what all he was doing, Joe, see if this is accurate. Uh, I, I liken this to the story of the lemmings. Lemmings are a rodent that lives, I think, in Norway, somewhere in that area. They're just little rats. Probably over in Alabama, I think. <laughs> we got lemmings, but not these type. <laughs> lemmings in Norway, every, I don't know, four to five years, whatever the time frame is, not really important. But they make these mass migrations that end up at the North Sea where they jump off into the North Sea and commit mass suicide. There's hundreds and thousands of these little rats running across the hillsides like caribou on the migration. And what's going on in America is because of the greed of Wall Street, the corruption in government, the advertising industry, we have created in this country a bunch of financial lemmings. They are all headed to the same cliff to jump off together. They're trying to max out a retirement plan at work because they don't know what else to do. They're actually trying to send extra payments to their mortgage company. That's a whole nother seminar right there. Um, they bought term insurance because someone told them, some promotional guru, that you should buy term and invest the difference. In the real world, people spend the difference. They don't have the discipline to invest the discipline. And so they're all doing the same thing. And if you want to get out of that pack of lemmings, you're going to have to do some things differently. 
And that's where infinite banking comes in. Right. How does that sound, Joe? That sounds right. I mean, you have to, uh, you have to take, you know, that chance, you know, it's a chance. Um, it could be risky, but I mean, you have to make a change. Um, again, it, once you understand this though, I think all of that, those fears go away because um, it's really putting you in control of your financial future. And, and, and I'm glad you brought that up, Jerry. And uh, Joe, maybe you can speak to this. But so Joe, uh, in the beginning, uh, was like most people, whenever they hear this, he says, oh, it sounds good. But then um, they always want to know how much does it cost? And they want to know the minimum they're, they're trained, like Jerry was just sharing, to put the minimum, right? Well, Nelson always said, have you ever heard of anybody having too much money in the bank? Hmm. Right? So when Joe came to the think tank, it really was, I think, a light bulb for him because yeah. next thing I know, he's telling me he wants to put all his money in. Put all the money. <laughs> well, they wouldn't even let him do that. But, yeah. but Joe had already progressed to the last chapter of the book where Nelson says that. It says all our money should flow through our bank. And yeah. it takes time normally, uh, you know, 5, 10, 20, 30 years for some people. But Joe got it pretty quick. Yeah. And uh, so – uh, that's where he is, and, and we really appreciate you sharing that with us, Joe. And uh, sure. I want you to stay on if you can. Um, uh, Jerry's going to share some things with you now just about interest because uh, another one of the questions that we get uh, quite often is uh, what, what about, you know, the interest that, that we're paying and, uh, and all of that. So, um, Jerry is going to share with you here. I'll, I'll let me back up a little bit. I don't. I don't know if I. Uh, is it okay if I go ahead and share that, Jerry? Or go ahead and put it up. Well, I'll. Uh, I'll, I'll just leave it here. So, um, just a little bit about about Jerry here. I was introduced to Jerry a few years ago, and um, I'm I'm so glad I was. Uh, I, I've learned a wealth of knowledge by by working with him. Uh, just because he has experience. He's done this, he's been in these uh, positions. He's met probably every situation or case uh, that there is out there. And, um, and I've been very blessed and fortunate to work with him. I, I know he cares about uh, his clients and what he's doing. And, um, and again, uh, 40 years of experience in this business. So uh, thank you, Jerry, uh, for what you do. And um, uh, he's gonna take one of the most, uh, often asked questions we get is what about the interest and uh, you know what's the difference between really compound interest and simple interest so uh, I'll let him take it over from there so this is Jerry Wood Jerry you go ahead well um, years ago I didn't know how to handle the question but I got the question you know when you borrow money out of one of these policies they do charge interest it's a loan uh, otherwise, otherwise the insurance companies couldn't survive. And, uh, Hey, uh, can you show the two interest things before I share that? Yes. Okay. So it's he done. asked me a, a point blank question. Mm -hmm. Why should I pay the insurance company 4.4% interest when I can get it financed through whoever at 2.9? And Jerry, let me just interject a little bit there. So every insurance company is a little different. We're independent agents. Uh, one of the main carriers we use today uh, does offer 4.4%, but that rate could be 8%. It really, the, the rate and what Jerry, I believe is about to explain to you, the rate is not the concern here, okay? Uh, but, but so I just wanted to share that with, with people. The rate is a variable rate, okay? So rates are low now, uh, interest rates are low. Dividends well, are low now, rates go up, dividends go up. So it's all relative. Uh, I don't want you to get caught up too much in the numbers, but I just wanted to, to add yeah. that in there, Jerry. Well, I didn't know how to handle the question at the time, Barry, because I didn't understand what I do now. Right. Younger in the business and still kind of like Joe trying to get my head around all this. <laughs> but today I would tell that person, you know, it's not the interest rate that's getting you. And there is a huge difference between 2.9 versus 4.4 when one is simple interest and the other is compound. But let's just show you an example of what I'm talking about. You're looking on the screen and Barry's showing you an amortization 
for an automobile loan at uh, $50,000 over a five year period. And we've got the first year month by month and then the second, third, fourth and fifth are year end figures. So we've got 3.9%. If you do the math, if you add up the interest. Is it 3.6, Jerry? Yeah, 3.6 is what's up there right now. And okay. we're gonna go to a lower interest rate just to prove the point. Okay. So two point, or excuse me, 3.6, the first year on that payment of 910.53, you have a total outlay of almost $11,000. And 16,000 plus is nothing but interest. And by doing a little simple math, you can see that you didn't pay 3.6 interest that first year, you actually paid by volume 14.8% interest. And if you pay it through the entire five years, and most people, by the way, never, they trade their vehicles before that five years, so they start back on year one, it's just a vicious cycle, like Joe has explained. But anyway, if you paid the, uh, the total payments, you have spent $54,631.80 for an automobile. It's paid for, but that 54000 is no longer in your bank. It's in someone else's bank. And the volume of interest, there's a math at the bottom of the sheet, is not 3.6. It's 8.5%. Math doesn't lie, folks. There it is in black and white. So you might think that, well, wait a minute, there's a bank down the street or a car dealer that's got a lower interest rate. Can you show that screen? Okay, so we go down the street and we get a full point less interest. Wow, what a deal. We get 2.6% interest. First year volume, 11%. That's not 2.6 in anybody's calculator. And if you make the full five years, again, that does not happen in America. Most people are trading vehicles before the car is paid for and they're starting over at the first year. So you end up paying $53,334.60. Again, that money has left your bank. It will never come back. And so you've lost the growth that's potential on that money. And if you paid it through the entire uh, five years, you will end up not paying 2.6% interest, but six and a quarter. So I th if that doesn't prove the point that it's not the interest rate that gets you, it's the volume of interest that you pay. You also know, and Barry spoke of this earlier, if you have a mortgage, I don't care what the interest rate is. I don't care if it's 3% or 5%, those first few years, you're paying nothing but interest. That is compound interest. If on the other hand, you make a loan from your insurance policy against your cash value, the interest rate is simple interest. That means if you have a $10,000 loan, the interest rate is $440 period end of sentence. That is exactly 4.4 and it's not anything like what you're looking at now. The neat thing is that on these loans, I don't want to get too deep in the weeds, but on these loans, when you make the loan, they charge you the next year's interest up front. So if you made a $10,000 loan, they would gross up that amount of money borrowed to $10,440. If on the same month or the month after that, you start repaying the loan like you would if you borrowed the money from a bank, then you are gonna start getting a refund of the unearned interest. In other words, they charge you for 12 months interest if you made a one, one twelfth payment. There's gonna be a refund because you did not have that full amount financed for the entire year. I hope I'm making that as clear as I can possibly make it. So you I end think up, when we show them that screen, they'll get it a little, a little I better. Do too. I think you're fixing to see what I'm talking about. You'll notice on this example that we did not take the client's name off of this example. This was actually uh, 
texted to me from Dr. Nelson. Dr. Nelson doesn't care if you know what he's doing. He's proud of what he's doing. And he told me, whatever you do, don't black out my name because I don't care. Those people are rare in this world. But anyway, Dr. Nelson, uh, if you saw the last webinar, financed, uh, this is an MRI machine. And he did it through his insurance contract. He had $100,000 sitting in a bank account, and uh, he thought, well, I'm not earning any interest there. I won't tell you how he described it. He was earning, earning blank interest. <laughs> so he sent the $100,000 to the insurance company to apply towards his loan, and they gave him an interest refund of almost $3,000. And I remember telling, you can see the figures there, Barry. Can you uh, highlight that? Yeah. Yeah, it dropped his loan balance from 222 down to 119. That's 100,000 plus the 2979 refund of interest. And this is a guy who, like Joe, it really gets it. I mean, he is a financial monster. I, I've created just a, a monster here. He's pushed me to learn more, and so I give him credit for that. But when I told him this, I was amazed at his answer. I said, well, you know, Eric, it's just another account. You had $100,000 in one account. You paid it to another account. You got $3,000 of a interest credit. And I was amazed what he said next. He said, I never thought of it that way just another account. He wasn't doing too well in the account he was in, so he moved it to another account and did much better. Now, you, you should understand and follow this. There are two kinds of insurance companies out there. There are stock companies and there are mutual companies. And both of these companies pay dividends. The question is, to whom? A stock company has to pay the dividends that they earn to their policyholders. A mutual company pays the dividends to their shareholders. Now think about this. If you own stock in a, a regular company, a public stock company, they are under enormous pressure every quarter to pay a dividend. And that pressure sometimes will put them in a position where they make an investment to feed the stockholders need that quarterly dividend. It's not really a need. It becomes a demand or an expectation. And they make an investment to satisfy that need that they, did, they don't feel that good about. I mean, that's just logic. A mutual company doesn't have that pressure, so they're able to take a more sober, long-term approach to their investing. But if I stop right now, I'm betting if you, if I made it clear what I was saying here, that if you had a choice, you would choose a, a mutual company over a stock company. Back in 2008, 2009, when we actually, as uh, taxpayers, bailed out a large stock company, uh, there was not a single mutual company with whom I'm familiar that was having any trouble whatsoever. Another, uh, another point I want to make is in 2000 and, well, no, I, I, I want to go back to this point. The eighth miracle of the world is compound interest. And whether you realize it or not, when you develop one of these policies, the interest is compounding. It's not compounding annually, it's compounding every day. If I call and I get Eric Nielsen's cash values today, by the way, on all eight of his policies, they're gonna give me a figure of X. If I call tomorrow and get the cash value, it's gonna be X plus one. That money is compounding. And at the end of the year, they have a stockholder, or excuse me, you know, policyholder meeting, and the, uh, the financial people like Joe say, well, how did we do? Well, we did pretty well, so let's pay a dividend. Um, that's just extra money to go into the policy to compound in the future. 
So these contracts are not something you can purchase off of an advertisement to visit our website and get cheap terms. These policies are specifically designed. You cannot pull one off the shelf and accomplish what Joe is accomplishing now, what Dr. is accomplishing now. You know, I fell 40 feet in 2009. It wasn't 39 feet, it wasn't 41 feet, it was exactly 40 feet. And when I realized that I was fixing to fall, I remember thinking, this is it. I'm not going to survive this at all because I knew how high I was. And uh, got life flighted out of the woods, had about 18 surgeries in five years. I, everything that could go wrong did go wrong. And were it not for the cash in that policy or policies that I have, I would have lost everything I own. So I'm telling you, you don't know what's going to happen to you in the future. You need to have money that's accessible without going through a bank loan committee. Because if you don't have the ability to repay the loan, you're not going to get it. So, Barry, I could go on, but <laughs> I wanted well, thank to say you, Jerry. You the difference between compound and simple interest. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate you sharing that. So we're, we've pretty much used our time, and uh, I'd like to just open it up to questions here. Uh, if you have any questions, I uh, appreciate you uh, typing them in there. Uh, so uh, I see that uh, the first question I have here from April um, is she asked, what is the difference between our company and private family banking? Well, understand this is private family banking. Uh, someone else just took that name and labeled it. Uh, I actually... Uh, on a website as well called uh, Family Bank Business. So anybody can go out there and buy a website uh, if somebody else doesn't already have the name. So uh, that's a, a group out of uh, Florida uh, and nothing against them. They, they do utilize this. I will just say though, I've never met, uh, I believe the guy's name is Don, that's the president of the company. I've never met him. I've never seen him at a think tank and I've been to the last uh, 20 minus uh, one. So, um, you know, I, I support infinite banking. I support this. And so infinite, the infinite banking concept is what all of that is based around. If you go to Amazon or you just want to research books, becoming your own banker is the book that all of this uh, is based on, including uh, what, um, they're doing at, at Private Family Bank. It's all based on this best-selling book from Nelson Nash, and all they've done is taken the name to uh, to rebrand it. So, um, you have anything to, to say on that, uh, Jerry? She asked, what's the difference between this and Private Family Banking? And this is Private Family Banking. Again, somebody just... They just rebranded it. They yeah. rebranded the concept. Yes. Uh, so so that's a good uh, question. Yeah, it really is. So, she also asked... Um, April asks, where is the money kept and is the money being invested? Is it possible to lose money? Uh, well, that's a good question. I guess uh, I'll let you maybe answer that, Jerry, and then uh, if, you, if you want to, or I can answer it. I think I'd like to take it and you can improve on what I say. Um, insurance companies are getting, first of all, it is not possible to lose money. Uh, you will grow the money every day. So once it's accredited to your policy cash value, it's not at risk. Um, so insurance companies get money in, premiums in every business day. And they do not get that money in on say Monday and have it invested by Friday. It sits in a pool while they look for places to invest it. And I've been on the field advisory board of my one of my primary companies, 13 different years. So I've sat as close to the chief financial officer on multiple occasions as you can sit. So what I'm fixing to tell you, I, I heard from the horse's mouth. At one point, this company was sitting on $1.2 billion of treasury notes because they couldn't find enough corporate bonds to invest in without you know getting risky. And they just don't do that. So, 
the money that you, but when you have a policy, let's just say it had a hundred thousand dollars of cash value, you can borrow that money. And the loan that process goes like this, they don't take the loan out of your policy. They use a special account where the premiums are waiting for an investment and you have first call on where they invest that money. They cannot turn you down. So when they send you a check based on the cash value of your policy for a policy loan, your money is still in the policy. It never left. In fact, it serves as collateral for the loan they've made you. So if the money never left the policy, ask yourself this, do you think it's still compounding? And the answer is yes, it is. Will you still get a dividend based on full value of your policy at the end of the year? And the answer is yes. Now you cannot do that with another asset that I have found on this planet where you can have the money doing two jobs, co-generation, Joe, and it's still growing. Right. It's still growing. And that is the real bottom line miracle of cash value life insurance yeah. and infinite banking. Did I make that clear? I think so. I'll, I'll yeah. elaborate a little further uh, just to make sure that we, we answer your question. Um, so this chart is right out of Nelson's book. Um, and as you see, banking is a process. It's not a product. So if you have not read that book, April or anybody else on the call. That's the first place I would start because you want that book. Uh, Nelson called it a textbook. This is, this is a whole new learning experience. This is a, a paradigm shift from what we've been taught. Okay. So you'll want that book as a reference, not only for you, which Nelson says we should read the book, every year at least one time. Uh, I believe Jerry said he'd read it 60 times. I've read it probably 15. I've seen Nelson live at least 15 times and uh, he's been done cinema, cinema, seminars for me on multiple occasions and I've listened to the CDs over and over and over as well. So you're not going to get it all the first time is the point and the book is a reference. It's also something that you can share with your family or friends or loved ones and uh, pass on to them or, or buy more copies for them. But uh, here's the way it works. So we put premiums into the pool, right? And like Jerry said, once the money's in there, you can't lose it. The only way that you can lose your policy or anything is if you don't pay the premiums over the scheduled time. Now, again, that's a whole nother um, ball of wax there, but you can set that time period up for, you know, one years to life, right? Which could be 121 years. So uh, most people like to do it over about 10 years, but some people do it to retirement age 65 or 75. And then other people uh, that really grasp this concept do it for life until they die because they realize that the money that they put in once that policy starts performing is going to outdo uh, any loan interest that they may have. So, um, and here's how it works. Like Jerry said, the policyholders have first access to the money. But see, insurance companies loan money to banks. Most people don't know that, and that's really the dirty little secret. Banks own more of this than anybody. If you just Google something called BOLI, bank-owned life insurance, you'll find that the largest banks and corporations in the world own it. Um, they won't tell you that. That's the dirty little secret. So they borrow money from insurance companies. See, insurance companies work just like banks. The difference is, as I showed you on that other screen, that the insurance companies actually have reserves, the money in the pool. Banks don't have to loan money on reserve. They loan money out of thin air. It's called the fractional reserve system. So that's why banks can fail. And there's, if you watch the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, you'll remember that the bank had a run. People came in to get their money. They didn't have any money. So what did he do? He said, well, I've got my life insurance contact, contract that has equity in the policy, okay? They also make uh, loans to uh, joint ventures. These are primarily big commercial loans, finance companies, and things like that, all right? But all of these are paying money back into the pool, just like the policyholders. We loan the money. The difference is the, it's a, it's a non-default loan for the insurance company because they know that they will get their money when you die. So if you don't pay the loan off, 
that policy, when it endows or you die, is going to pay that loan off. So there's no risk for the insurance companies from that standpoint. There is a risk for you or for me or anybody that puts money into this policy, and that is typically the first three years, right? So you can't just expect to put the money in and take it out and never pay premiums again, right? Nelson says you have to capitalize the policy just like you would a business, right? And once the money's in there, though, you can't lose it because of uh, the uncorrelated stock markets and things of that nature. But if you can pay those premiums for a minimum of three years, we really recommend 10 or more years, uh, then the policy really becomes kind of self-sufficient. In other words, the dividend that comes out can typically pay the premiums. Now, that's without loans. If you start making loans early, then you've got to repay the loans as well. Uh, and of course, there's death claims and expenses of operation, but the company understands that, and these actuaries, they're pretty smart guys. Uh, they consider them engineers, and uh, they overbuild these policies, so uh, they will uh, last, and again, uh, typically, they're looking out 100 years. Insurance companies are uh, one of the few companies that, that are looking towards the next month, the next quarter, or the next five years down the road. They're looking 100, 120 years down the road. So uh, hopefully that answers the, your question. And if you want to get you know further details, and uh, you can schedule a meeting and we can determine that. But um, uh, does anybody else have any, any questions? Um, does anybody else have any questions that they'd like to ask? I want to make a statement. Yeah, you go ahead. I met with a, uh, I don't know, 65 year old lady, 69 year old man. And they had a small dividend pay and whole life policy that I wrote them. I don't know, 20 years ago, premiums of $150 a month. He thought it would be wise to cash it in. And the easiest thing I could have done is sent him a surrender form. But I met with him and I showed him what I'm fixing to tell you. And by the way, this was not a, an infinite banking design. This was a product off the shelf. What I'm fixing to describe to you would have been better for them if it had been an infinite banking policy. Their premium of $1,800 a year, this coming year, the cash value is going to go up by $1,800 plus $937. Yeah, I mean, you can do the math. That's $2,737 increase in cash value on an $1,800 premium. So I asked him, did he want to make a 52% return on a small amount of money without paying taxes? And of course, he, he said, I never would have thought of that if you hadn't have shown it to me. And by the way, by the end of the fifth, five more years from this coming year, the return had gone up to almost 100%. In other words, an $1,800 premium would create almost $3,600 in cash value. Now, I want to ask you, if you had that 150 if it wouldn't make a change in your lifestyle, would you not want to pay that premium and get that return? If you start looking at this like a business where your premium is your overhead, think of it as the salaries, the rent, the expenses, Joe, yep. and the cash value is the increase is your gross revenue. And anytime your gross revenue exceeds your expenses, that business has made a profit. Anytime your gross revenue exceeds your premium, you are making a profit. And that profit is not taxed. So he knows there's no place where he can take that small amount of money and get a 52% return except in that policy. He will pay that policy as long as he lives now. Thank you for that, Jerry. Um, April has one more question here. Um, she says, I just switched my $50,000 nine year state farm term policy to a permanent whole life with cash value, same amount, but my premium went from 20 to $137. Is this okay? And if you decided to go through, uh, can, can I do that? So the short answer, um, yeah, so that's what happens. Uh, obviously a cash value permanent policy uh, 
up front is going to cost you more. In the long run, it's going to actually save you a lot of money. Now, ironically, Nelson, when he discovered this concept, had a State Farm policy. State Farm is a mutual company. The difference is they now focus on property and casualty with auto insurance being their, their biggest, uh, their bread and butter. Um, but they do pay dividends and Nelson actually shows his policies or he used to uh, when he was alive um, when at his seminar. So he would show policies that he bought 50 years ago that are just like Jerry just said, now paying crazy amounts of dividends, 10, 20 times what he ever put into the policy. So um, whereas the term policy will never do that. So that uh, is the big difference. Uh, the term policy is a temporary solution. You just want to be able, if you do buy term insurance, get the term insurance with a mutual company so you can do, I think, what you did, and that's convert it without evidence of insurability. Because if you buy term insurance from one of these low-cost insurers that you hear advertised on the radio or uh, they're, ba they're stock companies, uh, those policies, uh, you can't convert to one of these type of policies. And those policies will never pay a dividend. And they'll probably never pay a death benefit. Uh, so all of that money will be transferred away. And so what we're trying to show you is how to recover that money. So that's a great question. Um, and um, probably with your whole life policy, it's like Jerry was just explaining, it's probably just an off the shelf bare bones policy, which is fine. But what we do with infinite banking is actually turbocharge the policies uh, like Joe is doing. So you can have access to the cash value. And so your policy grows that much quicker uh, for you. And uh, again, you have to do that through a, uh, an IBC practitioner, uh, somebody that practices this, uh, which we go through, um, you know, a lot of licensing and whatnot uh, to do that. Um, trying to find a, can you find Joe's first illustration on his policy? What about it? Can you find his first illustration, uh, the first page of his uh, presentation where he was showing his policy that he uh, had with you? Yeah, you want to show that, Joe? You want to? Can you show us yeah, that, Joe? Yeah, I could. Let's see here. Let me Share it. I'm sorry. I got to take my screen down. There you go. If you'll notice, where's your cash? But which, go back to your, there you go. No, you've actually got where it shows how much you're putting in over and above the base premium. There you go. Yeah. The first line, $6,000 in premium for the base policy. No, yeah, I'm sorry. He's got six, almost $7,000 going into a base policy. That's a policy off the shelf, right? Right. Yeah. And then he's got additional money being put into that policy and what's called an additional paid up insurance rider of $62,871. And he also made an, an additional payment of 10,000. Yeah. And, and, and so just to clarify there, Jerry, um, and you can, you can jump in here, Joe, if you like, uh, but this is what we're talking about. Joe, he got this. Right, and so most people think they think six thousand. Maybe that's for a year. No, that's a month. Every month, right? So he, he he's and then and then the first year he he had a bonus that he wanted to go ahead and, and put down in this. So um, that's well, that's I wanted to point out. Excuse me for interrupting. I wanted to point out the fact that in the first year he had seventy one thousand dollars available right out of the gate. Right. Yeah. That would not have happened had he not put that extra money on top of that policy. Right. That is like a Titan rocket on a space shuttle. Now, people don't realize that a space shuttle cannot even get off the pad by itself. So they attach a couple of Titan rockets to it to lift it off the pad. And once they get it off the pad and they've done, the Titan rockets have done what they're supposed to do, what do they do? What do they do, Joe? They, they fall, fall off. <laughs> they fall off. Yeah. So he's going to do this until that policy is flying like the space shuttle on its own. And then they yeah. fall off. 
but the point is that extra money he paid came back to him and then some. Right. Yeah. And, and so you can only get this through an IBC practitioner, somebody that understands you can't even call the home office. Of course, they, they wouldn't sell to you direct anyway, but most agents do not understand this. And so that's, that's what we're trying to teach you here. It's a whole nother meeting. You'll get that uh, in your review or meeting if, if you want to, but Joe, did you have anything to add to that as far as, uh, uh, I mean, just, yeah, exactly what, you know, Jerry was saying, uh, you know, after that, after that 10 year point, you know, you'll see it goes back down, but look at your cash value, you know, almost a million dollars. So, yeah. yeah. So the emphasis is not on the death benefit, right? Uh, guys, it's, it's on the cash value and having access to the money. So if you want to utilize it for banking, then that's the way we do it. Now, if your plans are different, it's a state or, you know, maybe something else you're not concerned with utilizing the, the banking concept, you know, then an off the shelf policy uh, will of course work in that circumstance. So uh, thank you for uh, sharing that guys. Well, we're about out of, out of time. So uh, if I don't have any, any further questions, I don't, I don't really see any there. Uh, I'm just going to kind of uh, wrap it up and, and let you know how you can get started uh, with this concept. So, if you want to learn more, then the best thing for you to do is just to set up a review. There's a, excuse me, I know I'm going through, uh, uh, going through this real, real quick, but just schedule a no cost, no obligation financial review. It's real easy. Uh, you can go to legacyinsuranceagency.com forward slash IBC, just like right there. We'll show you how to capitalize your system uh, and how you can practice private banking, private family banking, infinite banking, again, it's all the same thing, but where you take control of the money. Um, so there's no cause for that, and uh, I'd appreciate you doing that. Uh, I do appreciate your time, everybody, for uh, sharing with us, Joe and Jerry. Uh, really appreciate that. And um, so Walt Disney said the best way to get started is to quit talking and begin doing and I know I talk a lot, so I'm going to quit talking and I'm going to let you request a meeting if you want to learn more. I would appreciate it regardless if you request a meeting or not. You take our uh, post IBC webinar survey. You should get an email that allows you to do that. Just tell us how we did. We want to get better. We want to improve. We want to do more of these. Um, if you like the way we've been sharing case studies, maybe you were on the last one, maybe this is your first one, uh, then, um, then let us know that. Um, but uh, guys, I'll let you guys close it out. Do you have anything else to say, uh, Jerry or, or Joe? Oh, I'll, I'll close it by saying this. He said I had read the book 60 times. I just finished the 61st reading. There you go. And it's never a waste of time. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing that, Jerry. All right. So if you haven't read the book, Becoming Your Own Banker, you can get it uh, from me or from Jerry, I'm sure. Joe probably even has a, uh, some copies, uh, yeah. but you can reach out to me. However you heard about this webinar is how you can get a hold of us. Uh, so we do appreciate your time today. Joe, thank you so much for sharing your story. You're welcome. Uh, anything you'd like to add before we go? Oh, I mean, just uh, continue on and, uh, you know, just never give up. Keep learning. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks guys for your time. We'll see you next time. Have a great day.